We often underestimate the technological capabilities of our ancient ancestors. They might not have had access to the internet, electricity, or any of the other modern conveniences we now take for granted, but they were every bit as inventive and resourceful as we are today. To prove that point, here are some remarkable archaeological discoveries that have stunned modern experts. Let's start with the most essential machine in any modern-day office, the vending machine. Incredibly, the vending machine has been around since the time of Christ. The first vending machines didn't sell snacks and soda, though. They sold holy water. The world's first ever vending machine was designed by Heron of Alexandria as a solution to a problem that had developed at his local temple. Priests had begun to complain that parishioners were taking more than their fair share of holy water and not paying the required temple tax to cover the cost of it. Heron's mechanical solution involved placing the water inside a cylindrical, coin-operated device. Inserting a coin in the appropriate place put pressure on a crank inside the machine. The crank opened a valve, and the water was released. When the coin slid away from its position, the pressure on the crank would ease and the valve would snap shut. Through this method, every worshiper got precisely the amount of holy water they paid for, and nobody was able to cheat the system. The vending machines of today are a little more secure and advanced, but they work on the same principle. The vending machine was far from the only one of Heron's inventions that was centuries ahead of its time. The Greek mathematician also invented the world's first automatic doors in the first century. The doors were operated via a surprisingly simple mechanism involving pulleys and steam. The design started with a hollow ball, which Heron fitted to tubes inside and then filled with water. He then placed the ball above a cauldron and heated it up. As the water in the hollow ball got hotter, it was pushed out through the tubes and spilt into a bucket, which was attached to a rope. As the bucket became heavy with water, it pulled the rope down, and the rope opened the doors. A similar method could be used to automatically open theater curtains. The system was impressive, but not very practical. In order to automatically open the doors for somebody, you'd have to first know they were coming so you could start heating the water. Heron probably used his automatic doors to impress a few of his friends, but they wouldn't have found much use for his invention at the local shops. It's still early in this video, but we've already seen that the technology available to the ancient Greeks was remarkable for its era. In fact, it was so advanced that they also had vertical standing showers. While showering has existed as a form of washing since early humans first figured out that they could get clean by standing under a waterfall, the first artificial showers were built by the Greeks during the second century after they figured out how to transport water in and out of rooms through lead piping. Rather than having a shower in your house though, you'd visit a large communal shower and wash together with everybody else. The Romans took this idea a step further and constructed their famous bathhouses. When the Roman and Greek empires fell, the technology behind the shower was lost for several centuries, because the people who lived in the lands they'd once conquered couldn't work out how to replicate their technology. We call this era the Dark Ages, but perhaps it would be more accurate to call it the Dirty Ages. The first modern-day shower powered by pumps was invented in London in 1767. Most people think of Leonardo da Vinci as an artist, but the great man would probably have been offended by that description. Art was just one of the many things that the Renaissance master excelled at. Among other things, he was also an inventor. To prove it, we can show you the robot that he invented in 1495. It's not one of his most famous works, which might have something to do with the fact that it wasn't found until the 1950s. That was the year that one of da Vinci's old sketchbooks was discovered, within which were designs for the automaton. There are some historical sources that suggest he displayed the robot for the amusement of Ludovico Sforza in the court of Milan at the end of the 15th century. 
It's said to have been able to sit, stand, move its arms, and lift up its visor on its own. Da Vinci would have orchestrated the movements from somewhere out of sight with a system of ropes and pulleys. After the sketchbook was found, a model was built according to Da Vinci's design, and it was found to work exactly as described. Let's see if we can get to the bottom of this next matter once and for all. Is the Shroud of Turin truly the piece of fabric that was wrapped around the body of Jesus Christ for his burial after the crucifixion? The answer to that is definitely no, but that's unlikely to shake the faith of those who believe in it. The Shroud was subjected to its latest round of scientific testing in 2018. The tests proved that the blood spatter pattern on the Shroud was fake. This is not the blood spatter pattern of someone who had the wounds that Christ is believed to have received while on the cross. It's real blood, but it seems to have been dripped onto the sheet from above, rather than oozing out of the body of someone wrapped in it. This finding concurs with a famous 1988 carbon dating test which demonstrated that the fabric of the shroud was made no earlier than the 13th century. The Turin Shroud didn't exist until over 1,000 years after the death of Christ, and the splatter pattern on it was added in an attempt to fool an audience. To put it in plain terms, the Shroud is a hoax. Your first thought upon seeing our next discovery is likely to be that you're looking at weapons, but experts think that's unlikely to be the case. It's a pair of metal claws that were recovered from the tomb of a high-ranking member of the Mochi Society in Huaca de la Luna, Peru, in 2014. The age of the artifacts is approximately 1,500 years. It's obvious that the claws have been styled after those of a feline, and they would definitely deal damage if someone were to scratch you with them but they wouldn't have had much practical value in a battlefield situation where everybody else had a sword. Ritual use has been considered, but we're not aware of any ancient Peruvian ceremonies that involved the use of claws. That's why some historians have come up with an alternative explanation. Sport. They think it's possible that the Mochi culture practiced a deadly version of boxing, in which both combatants wore these gloves to inflict damage upon each other. We guess that means you could class them as a type of weapon after all, but one that was used for recreation rather than warfare. Like many things in the Bible, the Siloam Pool was once thought to be a myth. The Gospel of John tells us that Christ used the water of the pool to heal a blind man, but the location of the pool was unknown. Christian tradition held that the site of the Siloam Pool was at the location of the pool and church that were created by the Byzantine Empress Eudocia, but she didn't order that work until the beginning of the 5th century, and intended her pool to be a tribute to the miracle, rather than a statement about its location. It wasn't until 2004 that archaeologists in Jerusalem announced the discovery of the real pool. It was eventually found by accident, during repair work on a large water pipe to the south of Temple Mount, which revealed two ancient stone steps leading down to a monumental Second Temple era pool. Further excavation revealed that the pool was fed by the waters of the Gihon Spring. This would have qualified it for use as a mikvah during ancient times. Siloam Pool was probably several centuries old even by the time of Christ, having been constructed to safeguard the city's water supply by King Hezekiah during his war with the Assyrians 2,800 years ago. Speaking of discoveries that correlate with things described in the Bible, here's the Tel Dan Stele. It's around 2,850 years old and was discovered in 1993 by the Jewish archaeologist Avraham Biran at an undisclosed site in northern Israel. The stone fragment is well known among biblical scholars because of its Aramaic inscription. Translating the inscription reveals that the stone was erected to honor a victory by the forces of an ancient king of Aram over Jehoram, son of Ahab, and king of the house of David. 
It's possible to interpret the words as a direct reference to King David of the Bible, although skeptics point out that David is hardly an uncommon name. And just because there was a house of David doesn't mean it was the house of David as described in the Bible. There also has to be a degree of willingness to interpret the text in this specific way to end up with this specific translation. Regardless of that, the stele was considered important enough to be extracted from the place where it was found and transported to the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, where it remains to this day. Making grisly discoveries is just part of the job for archaeologists, but sometimes the grisly discoveries they make surprise even the most experienced of them. Here's one from Bergen, France, January 2016. There, close to the country's border with Germany, archaeologists discovered an enormous pit full of amputated arms. Evidence suggests that the pit has been there for around 6,500 years. What might have been the cause of this apparent act of enormous violence in Neolithic France? The team also found seven human skeletons on top of the arms, but they appear to have been added at a later date, and perhaps without any knowledge that the arms were buried deeper in the ground. The arms do not belong to the people buried on top of them. Analysis of the bones suggests that the arms were amputated using an axe, and the hands were subsequently cut into pieces. This practice isn't consistent with any known human sacrifice ritual, so it may be more likely that it was a grotesque form of punishment. Alternatively, the arms might have been taken as war trophies after a battle. Speaking of mysterious skeletal finds, why were a group of people buried while shackled together on the outskirts of Athens in Greece around 2,600 years ago? The first instinct of archaeologists is that they may have been slaves, but why keep slaves shackled together when burying them? The latest theory about the skeletons, who were found in a mass grave in April 2016, is that the people buried here might have been followers of Cylon, who led an unsuccessful rebellion and failed to seize the Acropolis in the year 632 BCE. His supporters would have been punished severely after the failed coup. There are at least 1,500 people buried in the immediate vicinity, which supports the idea that Cylon's followers were rounded up and brought here to be buried. They might even still have been alive when it happened. Cylon himself managed to escape from Athens, leaving his followers behind to suffer. Historical sources suggest that an initial promise was made to allow his supporters to live, but the promise was broken, and most of them paid with their lives. In December 2015, archaeologists dug into the ground beneath the ancient convent of the Jacobins in Rene, France, and found this set of five embalmed human hearts buried inside lead urns. Prior to their discovery, they'd been buried for approximately 400 years. Using scanning technology that didn't involve opening the urns, researchers have been able to prove that the hearts inside them still contain their chambers, arteries, and valves. Some of them even still bear signs of the cardiac diseases that probably killed their owners. While the practice of removing a heart and entombing it separately from the rest of the body might sound odd today, it was considered romantic a few centuries ago. The heart would eventually be buried with the widow or widower of the deceased when the time came for them to die. One of the hearts, that of Toussaint Perrin, a knight of Brifilac, was found inside the lead coffin of his wife, Louise de Huigno, Lady of Brifilac. She passed away in 1656 and literally took her husband's heart with her to the grave. When you put it like that, it sounds sweet. Trying to explore the Arctic can be deadly and was even more deadly a little over a century ago when survival technology was less advanced. Not every Arctic explorer made it back home. In fact, most of the explorers on the Franklin Expedition of 1845 were never seen again. 
they were sent by the British Royal Navy to find a new route to the Orient via the Canadian Arctic. But one ship, the HMS Erebus, got trapped in the ice. A 2015 analysis of the remains of the crew revealed just how desperate things became in their final days. It seems that they resorted to cannibalism and took things to the extreme. Not even did they strip the flesh from the bones of their deceased crewmates, but they also heated and cracked open the bones so they could suck out the marrow. By the time they reached this state, it's likely that they'd been trapped for at least three years because of unusually heavy sea ice that didn't thaw during summer. The Erebus was supposed to be stocked up with five years of supplies before it sailed, but the crew must have become complacent during the first year and eaten more than their allocated rations. What a way to go! Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!